Hello everyone and welcome to the next topic, the substantive topic for criminal law known as mens rea. So previously we've discussed actus reus and causation. Uh, now let's see how much you remember first of all. Can I just ask as well, um, please like and subscribe if you find this video useful. So true or false to start with, recapping what we did before. Number one, to be guilty of a crime, the victim must have the actus reus and the mens rea. Now you can pause this video, but true or false? The answer is of course false, because it's not the victim but the defendant who must have the actus reus and the mens rea. Generally speaking, you cannot be guilty of a crime for failing to act. That's true. There has to be, if you remember, for an omission, a failure to act, a legal duty. So it has to be established and set in the law, either by precedent, a case, or statute. The actus reus can be committed one of two ways, and of course this is true. That's by the defendant uh, committing an act or an omission. The duty of care owed in the case of Stone and Dobinson was where you voluntarily assume a duty upon yourself, such as looking after a relative. That is true. He voluntarily looked after uh, or said he would look after his um, elderly sister and of course she was mentally ill and was quite difficult I think to deal with and he didn't help her and she died. The case of Miller showed a contractual duty when the defendant was charged with arson after failing to put out a fire. Now that of course is false. It wasn't a contractual duty. It was a duty arising from a dangerous chain of events that the defendant had started in this case when they um, started a fire and instead of doing something about it walked away for the defense to prove causation the factual cause and legal cause must be proven with evidence that is false it is the job of the prosecution to prove causation having established the actus reus not the defense the key test for factual causation is that the defendant's actions must be a more than minimal cause of the consequence or crime. And that is false because, of course, that is the legal test for legal causation, not factual. The key test for legal causation is but for the defendant's actions would the consequence of crime have taken place anyway. Now, that's false because we know just a moment ago that that is the factual cause but for and the legal cause is the must be more than minimal and lastly the legal prince the legal principle that you must take your victim as you find them is also known as the thick skull rule is false because it's the thin skull rule or otherwise known as eggshell rule do you remember the formula we started our topic with that shows when the defendant has committed a crime and of course that is for the prosecution to prove the actus reus plus the mens rea and that is a crime the exception being strict liability and absolute liability crimes where only the actus reus needs to be proven by the prosecution so let's look at mens rea the other essential element for a crime um, now what we can see here is my sort of pyramid of culpability um, as it travels upwards to the peak, that is the highest culpability or seriousness in terms of mens rea for a crime. So if you remember, the mens rea is the mental element of the crime, the guilty mind that needs to be proven by the prosecution for all crimes, except for strict liability or absolute liability. And at the top sits intention. So the most serious crimes are intent only known as specific intent offenses and a prime example being murder so a murder is as we'll learn later intent to kill or cause serious harm if you look at theft another example but this time against property uh, that can only be committed intentionally the intention to permanently deprive the other of the property of course, uh, below that we have recklessness. Um, there are many crimes that can be committed intentionally or recklessly. If there's recklessness in the offence, uh, in the mens rea, 
then we call that a basic intent offence, which is less serious than the specific intent offences where only intention is required to be proven by the prosecution. And below that we have negligence, which as a link to a future topic links with involuntary manslaughter and gross negligence manslaughter, but more on that later. And then at the bottom, as I mentioned, is strict liability, another future substantive topic where um, the defendant can be liable for a crime having only committed the actus reus. So with that in mind, moving forward, is motive the same as intention in criminal law? Motive, now you often hear that on TV shows or if you're watching, you know, um, dramatizations of court cases, detectives talking about motive and so forth, be it, you know, they killed someone out of jealousy, passion for money, whatever it might be. And I like to use the example here of Robin Hood. Robin Hood, the fictitious character, uh, robbed the rich, uh, you know, stole from the rich to, to sort of give to the poor. And many would regard Robin Hood as a hero. Nonetheless, the question is, you know, is he a criminal? And I think people would answer, yes, he is, by the laws of, of, of that land. So it's a good illustration to say that uh, motive is actually not, you know, associated with mens rea at all. Uh, to actually, for the prosecution to prove legally for there to be a crime, they only need to prove that one of those elements, or whatever, whichever relevant ones in the pyramid we just saw at present. Um, so again, another example, if you had a, uh, a young mother with very little money who uh, stole some food for a baby um, from, you know, from, from a grocery store or whatever it might be, um, she would, on face value, still be a criminal. She would have mens rea of theft, that intention to permanently deprive the other of it, uh, just as we can see here that Robin would have. So don't confuse it with motive. Just look for the relevant element of whether it's intention, recklessness, or whatever it might be. So if we start with the first type of mens rea, the one you'll probably most commonly come along, uh, you know, most commonly see along with recklessness. There are two types of intention. The first is direct and the second is indirect, which we also call oblique. Now, the key case for direct is the case of Mohan in 1975. And in this particular case, it's uh, I think the facts were that the uh, a police officer attempted to um, halt uh, a car and the driver of that car instead accelerated at the police officer. So the court questioned essentially what does direct intent mean? And they said it's a desire to bring about the prohibited consequence. So the defendant wants the crime to occur. And if we think of another example where somebody, for instance, has a gun and points it at the head of the victim and pulls the trigger, then it's quite clearly uh, their direct desire to kill the uh, the victim. And, and as we'll see in a later topic, the intent to kill is part of the mens rea for murder. However, um, not all crimes, you know, although some may be quite obvious, like the example I gave, not all crimes fit into that category. And it may be that the defendant tries to argue that, uh, you know, they had um, no mens rea for that crime or the sense of, you know, um, yes, I killed that person, but I didn't want that to happen. I didn't desire for that to happen or whatever it may be. And the key case that we have here, the leading case still, I think, by the House of Lords, which was our senior court uh, up until the UK Supreme Court then took its place. And uh, the case of Willen we can talk about here, which is where a father with his young infant baby uh, lost his temper, got angry. I think the baby was crying and, and, or, or choking at one point. And so the father threw the baby, um, I think, at the pram or at the cot or where it was, uh, and missed and the baby hit the wall and suffered serious head injuries and subsequently died. Now, charged with murder at trial, Woolen, you know, argued that 
he didn't have the mens rea for murder. Yes, his child was dead by his actions, but um, he, he, you know, he didn't uh, desire to kill his child. He was just lost his temper. And of course, the point being here is, it's quite significant for the defendant because if it's murder that's proven, it's a mandatory, automatic life sentence the judge has to give. Whereas um, anything less, you know, the absence of uh, mens rea for murder would be um, involuntary manslaughter, unlawful act manslaughter if you will, or constructive act manslaughter it's also known as, and that means that the judge would have a discretion as to you know, what that um, sentence could be. Now it could be a life sentence or it could be a lot less or it could be no time in prison at all. So what level of foresight should the defendant have? And what we mean here is um, if the defendant claims that they didn't desire the outcome much like the father in this case you know um, the law has kind of developed this sort of test of uh, foresight of consequences if the defendant can foresee the consequence of that outcome then it may be possible for uh, mens rea to be found by the uh, by the court or indeed by the jury if it's a murder case in the crown court now um, what level of foresight would be fair, bearing in mind that, um, you know, if it's a murder case, for example, we just described, then the um, consequence for the defendant, if they're found guilty, is going to be quite significant. It'll be a mandatory life sentence, they'll have a criminal record, uh, and that will obviously impact their life, and they will have um, their liberty, their freedom taken away from them. So, you know, what level of foresight should it be pitched at? If it's too low, and therefore it's far more easy to find the defendant guilty, you could say that that is unfair on the defendant. If it's too high, then you're not going to have perhaps very many, if at all, prosecutions. So that's one of the key issues to look at. So what level of foresight or foreseeability should the court be prepared to accept um, if they're dealing with cases of oblique intent? And this is where you know, we're finding the defendant at fault for that crime. Uh, they are to blame. So I do this activity with my students and you can freeze the screen uh, to do it yourself. But we've got, uh, you know, seven scenarios here. Uh, let's say, you know, how likely is it in each scenario that someone would be killed by the defendant's actions? And if you can put the numbers into the relevant uh, sort of part of the table is it impossible unlikely possible probable highly probable virtually certain or certain so to what level of culpability or blame should a court find someone guilty and so the numbers that I've put in here are uh, number five for impossible a man fires a shotgun into the air which contains blanks of course with it being fired in the air it's unlikely to kill anyone Unlikely would be number one. A man fires a shotgun out of the window of a remote farmhouse. Remote meaning, you know, isolated, no one around. Um, or certainly, it would be unlikely to kill anyone. Possible is three. A man fires a shotgun out of the window of a shop in the high street. Now, of course, a high street, you would think, would be populated. There may certainly be people in, in the vicinity. And so, a shotgun, when it's fired... Um, sort of like the, the, the pellets spread out and it would mean that somebody uh, it's possible could be could be injured or killed probable number four a man fires a shotgun in the direction of a bus queue 20 feet away and as I mentioned about the shotgun and the pellets that spread outwards the effectiveness of a shotgun is a lot less over a, a you know increasing distance so we'd probably put that at number four. Highly probable we've got seven. A man fires a shotgun at a bus queue six feet uh, six feet away. And um, of course that means the distance is a lot less. The effectiveness of the shotgun is increased. And it's highly probable that someone would be killed by that shotgun being uh, fired. Virtually certain we've got number six. A man fires a shotgun at the head of someone stood in his doorway. Um, 
again if you're aiming at the head you know vulnerable part of the body the doorway is a short space of you know short distance so it would be virtually certain and then certain therefore is number two a man fires a shotgun which he's holding directly at the head of his victim so it's quite clear there that there is a 100 percent certainty that the victim would die you can kind of put these into percentages roughly so certain means 100 percent so um, if you hold a gun at somebody's head that is clear virtually certain probably you know you're looking around about sort of 90 percent or thereabouts and and then obviously if we go down the scale probable maybe it's uh you know 51 percent and impossible being zero percent so finally in case of foresight of consequences i mentioned the woolen case um the court eventually settled on virtually certain as being the uh the test for foresight of consequences and so they made quite clear here that i think that the judge doesn't really want to interfere with the jury and give them you know a, a direction if they can help it um, they simply want to leave the jury to make the decision but if the jury um, ask or are confused uh, regarding their duty then i think the the precedent that's been set here very important to keep to the words for consistency otherwise there might be an appeal by the defendant which they'd likely win is did the defendant appreciate the harm caused by the actions was virtually certain or a virtual certainty and if the answer is yes be very clear here it doesn't mean that that is evidence of mens rea but it does mean the jury can choose to find uh, the defendant guilty because that is evidence of mens rea so it's not to say that it if you answer the test that it is mens rea but the jury can use it as evidence to choose to find it and that's a very important distinction so we can finish then with indirect and oblique intent being that test that we've just described one of virtual certainty and in an exam problem scenario question um, it may well be you're presented with a scenario where it may not be clear if the defendant uh, desired that outcome or it you know just for yourself uh, you're unsure then applying this test certainly uh, clarifies things so another example does the defendant have the mens rea for murder here i've got joe is angry with dominic who owes him 10 grand but won't pay it back Joe decides to try and scare him by stuffing newspaper through his letterbox and setting fire to it. However, Dominic is asleep on the sofa at the time and fails to wake up. The house catches fire and the victim dies in his sleep. Dominic denies murder. So, if we were to look here, this is a classic example of indirect or oblique intent. And we would ask ourselves, did Joe, um, by his actions, foresee that consequence? As, as virtually certain the consequence being that uh, Dominic dies and I think here it's a matter of opinion but the jury would most likely uh, you know find evidence here for for the mens rea of murder and therefore they could choose to find him guilty so the second mens rea type and one you'll come across quite a bit are for the basic intent offenses the less serious ones um, so it's now whether it's intentionally or recklessly. So what is recklessness? It's where the defendant realizes the risk but goes ahead anyway. Is this an objective or subjective test? Well, the test is now subjective. Does the defendant realize the risk? Subjective is about what the defendant believes. Objective test is where we measure that up against a sort of fictitious reasonable person that the court or jury have to to ask themselves so so now uh formerly where it was objective recklessness is a subjective one are the court satisfied the defendant realized the risk and um the key case here is cunningham and the picture of the gas meter there defendant rips the gas meter from the raw from the wall in order to steal money because it was a gas meter that you know um you, you sort of put money in for it to function 
and the pipe ruptured and the gas escaped in the property next door poisoning the neighbor who i think may well have been his uh, mother-in-law actually so the ratio decedendi the law coming from this case is recklessness is where the defendant realizes the risk but goes ahead anyway so this is the case you want to cite as supporting evidence uh, when discussing recklessness as mens rea. Now there are two further legal rules regarding mens rea that you need to know and again it's a case of whether or not in a problem scenario that you can spot these and therefore the examiner um, you know, wants you to discuss them. So the first is called transferred malice. So a very good example uh, or a quick one to do uh, imagine you know it's been snowing and the defendant with a snowball t intends to hit the victim in the middle but misses their aim is poor or perhaps the victim ducks and it hits um, I put X or you know the another another person now this is a, a rule that ensures that the defendant remains liable and at fault for the crime um, just because the victim is you know someone else shouldn't be a means for them not to be liable and one of the most common mistakes I think students can make when explaining what transfer malice is is they say that it's the actus reus that transfers to another victim and that's not true the key word here is malice this topic is mens rea so it's the mens rea that the defendant has you know towards a victim that is transferred to the other victim. And the law is essentially saying, well, just because, you know, through quirk of fate or otherwise, you didn't, uh, you know, you didn't injure or, or kill the victim you intended, your, your actions, you know, you still have the mens rea, so you should still be at fault. And the key case, there are many, but I think we're gonna use the Latimer case um, from, as I say, 1886, involving a belt. And here the defendant aimed a blow at the victim in the pub with his belt and it actually bounced off of the victim and hit a uh, nearby woman in the face. So that is the case we'll use to support the point of transferred malice where it is committing a crime against an unintended victim and it's the mens rea that transfers to the unintended victim. Now there is uh, a limitation we need to be aware of. The limitation is that it must be uh, for the same category of offences. So the case here is Pimbleton. So just very simply, if we go back to the scenario of someone throwing a snowball at the intended victim, but they miss, and it ends up hitting, for example, uh, you know, a window, and uh, you know, let's say cracks or smashes the window. The mens rea that's, you know, for property damage or for criminal damage is significantly different, isn't it? Because that's aimed at property, that crime, whereas the mens rea the defendant has originally is aimed against a person. So the law is not prepared, according to the Pembleton case, for it to transfer to a different category of crime entirely. So there will be no liability there. So... Um, clearly not all crimes occur instantaneously um, the law is prepared to interpret the defendant's actions as what we might call a continuing act um, in other words it can be committed over a period of minutes hours or, or even later and, and this is known as the um, coincidence rule or the contemporaneity rule so this is another rule of mens rea you need to be aware of and may arise and the case here we're going to use is Fagan and in Fagan, what we have here is a uh, police officer who uh, calls for the driver to uh, stop their vehicle and you know to park, and the driver of that vehicle accidentally drives and stops on top of the police officer's foot. Um, at which point, you know, the police officer's crying out in pain and telling him to 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 get off. Driver realizes their mistake, and then. Um, chooses out of spite i suppose uh, to to intentionally not remove you know the vehicle to to leave it part then basically said you can wait and so what we've got here on our timeline is we know don't we remember our formula actus reus plus mens rea equals a crime 
the guilty act of the crime here, which are, is a battery, um, non-fatal offence, is that the driver, Fagan, drives on the police officer's foot accidentally. So at that moment, the actus reus is in existence. But there's no crime, because as you remember, we need the mens rea. And as I said, this was purely by accident, and the driver wasn't consciously aware that uh, you know they had parked on the police officer's foot. But the moment that they realise and refuse to move shows intention. Uh, and of course with a battery it can be committed intentionally or recklessly. And therefore we have mens rea and therefore in the space of just a matter of minutes we have a crime. So the ratio of Fagan and the case you want to use for this point is a crime can be a continuing act. The courts are prepared to uh, interpret you know, the timeline of events um, in such a way that they recognise crimes don't always happen instantaneously, but as long as the actus reus and mens rea are present at the same time, the crime will exist. So we've got some scenarios here. Is mens rea present? Again, you may want to pause the video to look at these. Hayden wants to kill Jezebel, so waits until she walks home from work and drives their car into them. Jezebel dies. Is Hayden liable for Jezebel's murder? So I know that we haven't discussed murder in any great depth yet. It's a future substantive topic in a video. But just for mens rea, can we spot anything? And um, as it says, Jay, I'm sorry, Hayden wants to kill Jezebel, then this looks like a pretty clear-cut case of uh, direct intent mens rea. It's their intention, their desire to have that consequence occur. And we would use the case we mentioned earlier of Mohan to support that. Now the second case, Jacob, who works for a criminal organisation, is instructed to kill Leonard. Discovering that Leonard will be boarding a plane to Los Angeles, he plants a bomb on the plane. It detonates over the Atlantic, killing Leonard and 123 other passengers. Is Jacob liable for the deaths of the passengers? Um, now, you could probably see from here, you know, he has an intention to want to kill Leonard. But he is going to probably claim, isn't he, that it wasn't his direct desire to kill the other passengers. So this is a prime example of um, oblique intent or indirect intent, as we described. I've put possibly because it's going to be up to the jury, because this would be, I, one would think, a murder case. It would be up to the jury to, um, to apply that test. Uh, and this would be whether or not, um, you know, Jacob foresaw, uh, you know, the, the consequences of virtual certainty, the other passengers dying by detonating this bomb. And of course, I think it is virtually certain that you detonate that bomb and the other passengers, by the fact they're all on the same plane together in close proximity, would die. But the jury can choose to find uh, the mens rea for murder here. And so that's why I've put possibly. It's up to the jury. In the exam, we give our opinion. I would write that in all likelihood, I think they would. And so the case of Woolen is the key leading case for that test. We've got Nathan throws a hole punch at his colleague Peter while at work. He misses and it hits a window instead, breaking the glass. Is Nathan liable for a battery? Well, you will remember, of course, like we said earlier, no, Nathan has the mens rea, that intent uh, against uh, to commit a crime against another person, a non-fatal offence, but the consequent uh, consequential crime is one of uh, you know criminal damage against property. The transferred malice rule won't work. The crimes are not similar. And that's the limitation we discussed in Pemberton. Three more. Jamie leaves the stadium after watching his football team lose the cup final. He goes into a nearby takeaway shop and buys some chips when he sees a rival fan, Lee, start bantering him about the loss. Angry, Jamie throws his chips at Lee, but he ducks and it hits an elderly woman, Paula, instead. Is Jamie liable for a battery? So here, what we can say is that uh, when he throws the chips, Jamie, there is uh, a sort of clear intent there, isn't there? He wants to hit, he desires to hit uh, Lee, but as it 
passes to Paula, this unintended victim, this is a clear-cut case of transferred malice. So his mens rea is passes to uh, the uh, new victim, which is Paula. And so therefore, we would use the case of Latimer, the case we referred to earlier for the transfer malice rule with the belt, where it hit uh, a man but bounced off and hit a, a woman in the face, and he was liable for the injury to that, or, or, or the crime, uh, to that uh, unintended victim. We've got in the second one here. Joe is lured to an isolated cabin by a gang of men and beaten with iron bars. Believing Joe to be dead, they throw his body off a nearby cliff. In reality, Joe is not dead and falls onto a rock ledge. He dies from exposure, in other words, cold weather, extreme cold weather, hours later. Is the gang liable for his death? Um, now, here you can say that um, when they uh, you know, beat him with the iron bars and they believed him to be dead, uh, you could say this is um, you know, a possible murder case, certainly. Uh, they had an intent to kill him, or an intent to cause at least serious harm. So they have the mens rea at the start, um, but he's not dead. So it is in fact, you know, the passage of time later, hours, as it says there, that he eventually does die. And so that is when the actus reus, uh, you know, kicks in, when it's present. So we've got the mens rea at the start. We've got the Aptus Reis at the end, albeit hours later. They, um, you know, coincide. And so therefore, this is an example of the contemporaneity rule we described earlier. And we talked about this in relation to Fagan, um, you know, about it's a crime when the Aptus Reis and Mens Rea are present at the same time. But the facts of this case are more or less directly lifted from a case called Thabo Melli, which you may want to check out. Now we have, while at a carnival, Aki and his friend visit one of the stalls and decide to have a go at a tin can target game. The stall operator, Dylan, explains that they have to stand behind a mark and try to knock the cans down with a tennis ball. Showing off to his friend, Aki closes his eyes and wildly spins around laughing before throwing the ball, and it hits Dylan in the face, causing a bloody nose. So is Aki going to be liable for actual bodily harm? Is the mens rea present? Well... I think the key word to, well, I say, you know, it's linking to a future topic. Uh, for actual bodily harm, it's a statutory non-fatal offence that can be committed intentionally or recklessly. But just broadly, even if you didn't know that, we would say, looking at our pyramid of mens rea that we had earlier, it would be difficult perhaps for the prosecution to prove that uh, he intended to hit uh, a person you know, let alone Dylan, because he closes his eyes, Aki, and the key words as well, wildly. So closes his eyes, wildly spins. This is an example of being reckless. If you did, just as he did, uh, in proximity to people around you and threw a ball, then, you know, there's a risk, isn't there? You should realise the risk that it may hit someone. So therefore, that's what we have here. He has been reckless. In the case of Cunningham, that we described earlier, where the man tore the gas meter from the wall and in his haste ruptured the pipe that led to the neighbour being poisoned, um, is the case we would use to support it. So just very briefly, true or false, sort of a recap of how we're doing. The highest form of mens rea is recklessness, true or false? And the answer is, of course, false. It is intention. There are three types of intention. That is false because there are two, uh, direct and oblique, or direct and indirect. Direct intention is whether the defendant desires the prohibited outcome. We know that to be true. The key case for direct intention is Woolen. That is, of course, false because the case is Mohan. When the defendant commits the crime but doesn't desire the consequence, this is known as indirect intent. That is true, otherwise known as oblique intent. Foresight of consequences is not evidence of intention, but the jury can use it to find intention on behalf of the defendant. That is true. Remember the key thing? It's not the same if the you know test of, uh, is passed from Willin 
Um, the jury always can choose to find it. They may not, of course. Um, jury essentially, though they are directed by the judges to the law, can ultimately make whatever decision they, they feel they need to do. And seven, the key test for foresight of consequences in Woolen is that the defendant appreciates the consequence was highly probable. I think you're ahead of me on this one. It is, of course, false. It is virtually certain, not highly probable. If we had highly probable, that standard, um, that sort of uh, standard of proof, you know, the you know how good must the evidence be for the court or the jury to to reach a verdict? It would be a lot lower, wouldn't it? And therefore, it would be problematic because uh, far many more people would be uh, convicted of a crime, perhaps a serious one, and would face the consequences that we spoke about. Now, uh, some assessment objective three here, analysis and evaluation. Again, AO3 is relevant for a 10 mark problem question, uh, the 15 marks question, which is highly analytical and evaluative, and the 30 marks largest question problem scenario. We'll also expect you to cover this uh, to some extent as well. Um, just picking out some bits here. I said earlier that the test for recklessness is now subjective. It's about what the def you know whether the defendant realizes the risk. Uh, but goes ahead anyway. It used to be, however, um, objective. It used to be known from the case called Coldwell as Coldwell recklessness. This eventually was overruled by the House of Lords, our highest court, uh, now re replaced by the Supreme Court, in the case of RNG. And I think this case RNG illustrates why it was, you know, for, for the right and fair thing to do because here we have two the defendants who were two boys 11 and 12 years of age they found some newspaper they lit it they dumped it in a wheelie bin uh, they ran off um, what they didn't hang around to see is that the fire spread and actually i think it was a co-op store uh, caused one million pounds worth of damage now on an objective test if the court were to be satisfied that those two boys had the mens rea to be at fault, to be at blame for a crime, um, the test would have been then, uh, would a reasonable person have realised the risk? Now, I think, broadly speaking, you would say this fictitious reasonable person, well, it's common sense, isn't it? Would someone realise setting fire to, to something near a shop could cause uh, damage? And the answer would be inevitably yes, and therefore the boys would be convicted of a crime. But... That is certainly not fair to, um, you know, convict someone and give them a criminal record and all the consequences that follow if they themselves didn't realise the risk. Now, they didn't. They, they, they obviously, you know, insofar as setting fire to the newspaper, putting it in the bin, perhaps, but they didn't know the consequence of it then uh, spreading and causing damage to the shop. So um, the, you know, defendants in this case... Uh, thanks to the House of Lords, were, um, I think, acquitted. And it was established in precedent that it is a subjective test now that is the fair one. And then at the bottom I put here the coincidence of actus res and mens rea rule we talked about. Just illustrates, doesn't it, how not all crimes occur instantaneously. Um, so the law is prepared to view the defendant's act as a continuing act in order to achieve justice really and that's going to link to um certainly other topics i mean for example i think the case uh we've got uh robbery that's right robbery and there's the case of hail which you may well have come across and it's similarly just to paint you a picture if somebody were to steal something from a shop and then you know run out the shop and be chased by you know an employee or a, a security guard then the issue of robbery is essentially when has there been a completed theft and um again the the law is prepared to um sort of stretch that out and accept uh you know what outcome is necessary for there to be justice i think another i'm just trying to think off the top of my head that was hail that was in 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 robbery there was another one uh i can't remember the top of my head but but these are these are instances where that that's uh, that makes sense. And we talked about, didn't we, Fagan, the car parked on top of the 
police officer's foot, we talked about Faber Melly. In all those instances, ask yourself, you know, how is justice best served? It would be right to prosecute the um, driver of the car the moment he realises his mistake, but refuses mm -hmm. to move. And it would be right for those men who threw what they thought was the dead body of their victim over a cliff, but in fact he wasn't dead and he died hours later from exposure. The just thing there would be to hold them at fault, you know, for that crime. Um, and that's really where I'm going to leave because I think a couple of the exam questions now is, is sort of AQA based and I can't obviously show those here on the video. But, you know, do look at some past exam papers and, and just see, you know, um, in terms of uh, whether you can spot the issues that we've dealt with. So I'm going to wish you best of luck, everyone. And um, the next video I think I'm going to be doing is murder and voluntary manslaughter.